the Rangers maintained their hot start, taking two out of the first three against the Astros, despite a stinker on Sunday night. Everything is still going right for your Texas Rangers early on this year. We're we'll getting into why that is, all that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked onto the World Series champion Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Paddock, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan covering this team for 11 seasons, including all six as the founder and host of this podcast. Thank you all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Paddock. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. Hit subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform and on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the show is to comment nearly any single thing below. Now, before we get into the Rangers' domination of Houston the first couple games, a super weird Sunday night game, this episode is brought to you by PrizePix, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepix.com slash LockedOnMLB and use code, all lowercase, LockedOnMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Now, the Rangers absolutely dominated the Houston Astros in Friday night and Saturday night's game, just molly whopping them for the first couple of games of this series and dropped the Sunday night game, a nationally televised game. Two out of these first three games being nationally televised is, is kind of fun, honestly. Seeing the Rangers get some some different announcing crews and, and seeing this rivalry get the love that it deserves for the hate that it brings the two, I'd say the best rivalry in, if not all of Major League Baseball, then absolutely the American League right now. Talked about it all offseason, especially during the ALCS. So this is this is the best matchup out there. Two teams that hate each other, that are very close, that are both very good right now, <clears throat> and have a very, very spiteful playoff series to show for it. Maybe we'll see more, but uh, at this point, uh, it, it is the best rivalry going in the American League. And for those first couple games, literally nothing went wrong for the Rangers outside of Josh Spores' shoulder. We'll talk about that a little bit in the second segment. But for right now, the offense, the defense, the pitching, starting and relieving, every single part of this team was just absolutely cruising through these first two games. Ten runs in the first games, seven runs in the second game. <clears throat> and in both of those first two games, literally every single starter had a hit. It got so bad that even Marcus Simeon was taken out of this game late. Marcus Simeon, who never takes a day off, never even takes a half day off, played every inning of every game last year, all the way through the postseason. Didn't matter how many blowouts there were, because there there were quite a few blowouts last year. But it took, there was literally no situation where Marcus Simeon would take even a couple innings off. And that's what happened when Justin Foscue got into the game, ended up recording the final out, got his first at bat was a flyout. He said he did not want to strike out in his first major league at bat. The game was was well out of hand at that point. I believe he came in in the eighth inning when the Rangers were up 10 to nothing. Marcus Simeon had already gone three for three with a pair of walks and a three-run homer because Marcus Simeon just owns the Houston Astros. As does Adolis Garcia. It's, it's kind of a co-ownership situation. Adolis gets more of the, the publicity and the love because Marcus Simeon didn't have the best ALCS last year, while Adolis Garcia had literally the best ALCS last year, hence the ALCS MVP. But during the regular season, both those guys just absolutely lit into the Astros, and that continued this weekend as Marcus Simeon had a phenomenal weekend, his first home run of the season, and he just continues to swing a hot bat, as does literally everybody on this Rangers offense. Outside of Really, that's how did White Langford and, and Jonah Hyman. I think both those guys' seasons will come along. We'll talk more about White Langford's struggles later on in this show. But even even Evan Carter, who started the year 0 for 15 with granted a bazillion walks, but still 0 for 15, got a half, <clears throat> got a day off on Wednesday. Then the Rangers had the travel day on Thursday. Evan Carter comes back in on Friday and is just absolutely gripping it and ripping a couple of hits for him on the day, including his first of the season. And Evan Carter getting hot and he said this on the broadcast on Sunday night he said well 
if you know a five game stretch where I go over and, and still get six walks is the worst it gets in my career, I'm going to have a pretty darn good career. And, and I think that's the case. And I've talked about it a lot with Evan Carter that this the floor on this kid, even when things are going wrong, even when the swing is not there, he is still not expanding the zone. He is still not chasing. He is still not trying to do too much. And his elite plate discipline will always be there. So the walks will always be there, as will his speed and his base running. And the starting pitching on Friday, it's just masterclass. Just an absolute masterclass from Cody Bradford. Seven and two-thirds innings, just two hits, no walks, four strikeouts, and one earned run, which came off of a reliever, Yeri Rodriguez, who comes in and gives up a dinger to the first guy that he faces. So, of course, one of the three base runners that Bradford had in the game, one of them was on an error. Two of them were on singles. And the only one that scored did not score while he was on the hill. A masterful performance from him, and the Rangers did got a win against the Astros without having to use any of the A side of their bullpen. That was a good thing for these Rangers. Definitely something to keep track of as the Rangers are in the middle of a 17-game in 17-day stretch of how often they are using the A side of their bullpen, how frequently those guys are taxed, how long those guys are going in games. The Rangers had to use a lot of it on Saturday's game because John Gray, despite not having the the best game, did enough to keep those Rangers in at three and two-thirds innings, but three walks for him, five hits, but two unearned runs because of a uncharacteristic bobble by Corey Seager that extended the inning and allowed those two runs to score. But the Rangers bullpen on Saturday picked them up. Brock Burke with a scoreless outing. Jose Urania with a scoreless outing. Kirby Yates, David Robinson, Josh Spores, Jose LeClerc, all of them scoreless outings while it was still a close game. Rangers didn't pile on till late in that game. It was a 7-2 final, but it was 3-2 from the sixth inning to the seventh inning, and then the eighth inning, which was one of the most just classic Rangers innings. It's what made this offense so good last year. When they had the big inning, it's usually not walk, walk, three-run homer. Usually it's walk, single, walk, single, single, double, single, single, just everybody getting in on the action and just piling on on these pitchers, and they do that to everybody, no matter who it is, whether it's the starter, whether it's an elite reliever, whether it's a mediocre reliever. They did it to Ryan Presley. They just absolutely abused him. Five hits, four earned runs, one strikeout, one out for Ryan Presley in that eighth inning, trying to keep it a close game. It was still a one-run game at that point. The Astros still had some hope, and the Rangers used most of the ace out of their bullpen. Even Jose Leclerc came in in the eighth inning to relieve Josh Spores in the middle of an at bat because Josh Spores will be placed on the is placed on the 15 day IL with a right rotator cuff strain and Grant Anderson was called up to replace him. But even the starting pitching on Sunday's game where the Rangers lost, it was still a solid outing for Dane Dunning. Literally one bad inning got to him. Just one bad inning, one big swing by Jordan Alvarez was the entire difference in this game. Outside of that, Dane Dunning was pretty fantastic, honestly. Seven strikeouts, three walks, though. Two of them came in the same inning. Four hits, one of them the three-run bomb by big bad Jordan Alvarez. Walking guys in front of that man is usually not a good idea, especially if you're going to give up that home run. Just not the best timing there. And then the Rangers just ran into the buzzsaw, I guess, that is Ronel Blanco and the weirdest and worst strike zone I think I might have ever seen on Sunday night's game. Not only just big and bad, but inconsistent too, which is mind-numbing. But hey, you shove off a game like that, the Rangers offense still was doing enough, still made it close, still got a run off of Josh Hader in a save situation. And the run, of course, came by the rookie Justin Foscue. Of course it did. Why would it not? A seven pitch at bat by the rookie. Pinch hitting, by the way, in the ninth inning. He hasn't gotten a whole lot of time. Just those two innings in Friday night's game. And then this at bat where he gets his first base hit. And of course, it's off Josh freaking Hader. A seven pitch at bat. We fouled off some sinkers. Fouled off, excuse me, a sinker. Laid off the changeup. Laid off the slider. And ended up getting a fastball that he liked. 
driving in the run. And had it not been for some great defense in the outfield by the Astros, which, by the way, the Astros might be the only defensive outfield that might be better than the Rangers uh, in Major League Baseball because they have two left field, two center fielders. One guy plays left field, one guy plays center field. And then Kyle Tucker is pretty darn good out there in right field. But the Rangers still making it close in a game where their offense looked just absolutely overmatched. Ronald Blanco is still riding the high off of that no-hitter magic. I don't know that he is going to keep throwing basic one-hitters and, and no-hitters. Doesn't seem super sustainable for a guy who is not blowing by you with the absolute nastiest stuff. But even on a day like that, Rangers still make it close, and they are keeping themselves in the hunt. Coming up, we're talk about Josh Spores' injury, why it makes such a big difference, and another Josh that is having a fantastic season right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Spring training is over and baseball season is officially underway, which means it's your chance to add your favorite players from the diamond into in your prize picks entries. Whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, first inning runs, take your pick of more or less and add them to your prize picks entry today. Prize Picks has something unique for all sports fans, from baseball to basketball to League of Legends and everything in between. You can pick LeBron, Shohei Otani, Conor McDavid, and Jude Bellingham all in the same entry. Prize Picks is so simple to play, you can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. Prize Picks also offers weekly promotions and special offers for the biggest moments in sports. Download the app today and use code LOCKDOWNMLB for your first deposit match up to $100. Download the app today, use code LOCKDOWNMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Shout out to the everyday just making Lockdown Rangers your first every single day. On tomorrow's show, we'll be back and talking about the final game of this four-game set against the Houston Astros. Now, the Rangers got some bad news on Sunday and Saturday night's game. Josh Spores left in the middle of an at-bat, was shrugging his shoulder. Didn't look like much of anything was wrong. Had a two-strike count. Jose Leclerc comes in, throws one pitch, gets the strikeout, gets out of the jam, and does end up getting his first save of the season. But the Rangers do some imaging and find out that Josh Spores will be on the 15-day IL with a right rotator cuff strain, and Grant Anderson was the one called up to make his debut for the season and to be on this roster while Josh Spores is on the shelf, which is a bummer for the Rangers because Josh Spores looked truly fantastic so far this season, as has pretty much everybody in this Rangers bullpen. The Rangers have used... 10, no, 9 relievers. And only 2 of them have given up earned runs so far this season. We're 9 games into the season, and only 2 relievers have given up runs. And, well, one of them is your closer in Jose Clark, who's got a 1350 ERA. But, again, he's usually pretty slow to start the season. And then the other guy is literally the last man in your bullpen, in Yuri Rodriguez, who at times has also looked pretty darn good this season. But David Robertson... Jacob Latz, Kirby Yates, Jose Urania, Josh Spores, Brock Burke, Grant Anderson, none of them have allowed an earned run at all. Now, Grant Anderson comes on, and of course, the first batter he faced the first day that he's up is Jose Altuve, and he gets a, a an ungenerous non-strike call, but ends up striking out Altuve, looking on three pitches that were, to be quite honest, pretty hittable. But in a big spot, he comes up, gets out of the jam, turns the ball over to Jacob Latz, who has looked fantastic early this season. Really, honestly, fantastic. And had one of the better at-bats against Jordan Alvarez that I have seen in quite some time. Outside of Jordan Montgomery making Jordan Alvarez look silly with that death ball in the ALCS, this was some of the best pitching that I've seen to him got a really big swing and a miss on the curveball a very good velocity separator on that the top end of his his range which is 95 96 with the fastball and then mid 70s with the curveball that's a pretty darn good speed differential and he got Jordan Alvarez to look silly and Jordan Alvarez doesn't look silly very often but David Robertson and Kirby Yates so far this season have looked fantastic and they're they're going to need to step up and the Rangers can't really afford for Jose Clerk to struggle early on this season. They need what he looked like on Saturday to be what he looks like moving forward, at least for the short term, with Josh Boers on the IL for now. But this bullpen being deep and having these options, having Grant Anderson be the guy that you can call up, and if Anderson 
doesn't get the job done, then there are a few other guys that are on the 40-man roster that could end up being called up and, and might still end up being called up at some point in this 17-game and 17-day stretch, be it Mark Church, be it Antoine Kelly, um, be it maybe Owen White. No, we'll, we'll slow down on that one. But still, the Rangers having options in their pen is absolutely massive, as is having a number of Joshes. This is two Josh injuries in a week. I am very worried about Josh Smith. Someone wrap him in bubble wrap because the Rangers have lost two Joshes this week. They have a third. They still have a third. And all of these Joshes were doing fantastic this season, especially the first two before they got hurt. But Josh Smith has been very quietly exceptional to start this season. Exceptional is the word I'm using because it's accurate. Go look at his baseball savant page and tell me your jaw doesn't hit the freaking floor. Look at the numbers. He's expected Woba, top 1% of baseball. Expected batting average, top 2% of baseball. Sweet spot percentage, top 3%. Chase rate, whiff rate, strikeout rate. All those in the top 1% of baseball with the chase rate and the whiff rate. The number one guy in Major League Baseball at not expanding the zone, at not swinging missing. That's right. It's Josh freaking Smith. He's been exceptional. He is hitting the ball hard. He's playing good defense at third base and at shortstop. He has phenomenal at-bats, and it can really hit the ball a lot harder than I think he gets credit for. Zeke is definitely the one who is who is thought of as the power hitter among those two, and granted, I think that's you know fair because Zeke has put it into play in games a little bit more often. He's got some strong wrists. I, I think in terms of general raw power, just you know pure muscle mass and strength neither of these guys are top end of the spectrum but they can get some really hard hit balls and when josh smith gets a hold of one same with zeke duran but he can really send it a long way and combining that with good defense with not chasing at all at just an insane rate like the chase rate of 8.6 percent that that's nuts that's like what (laughs) that's what evan carter did for the last month of the season last year. It was actually a little bit better than Evan Carter did for the last month of the season. Granted, it's, you know, 20 plate appearances, so we might need to calm down just a little bit, but Smith is earning that playing time, and Bochy is riding the hot hand while Josh Young is out. It's next Josh up at this point, and Josh Smith is taking his advantage, taking his chances, and he's running with it. And it seems like the Rangers are going to go with a pretty strict platoon at this point especially while Josh Smith is is swinging such a hot bat. And at this point, how can you question it? How can you question the guy who is putting together this good of at-bats and has been this quality of a player for his major league career? In terms of asking for who, how can you ask for a better second choice starting infielder or backup infielder? You really can't. And at this point, he's the first choice backup infielder, which means he's an everyday infielder because Josh Young is on the shelf for two months. So the Rangers need this from Josh Smith. Maybe asking Zeke Duran to replicate his near all-star level first half last year from when he was filling in for Corey Seager. Maybe that was a bit much to ask. Maybe Zeke Duran isn't that guy. I think that he is personally, and I'm surprised he isn't getting a little bit more chances, but hey, at this point, you got to ride the hot bat and Josh Smith is hot as all heck. And in terms of the other platoon at first base, well, I don't know how much longer we're going to be seeing that. I don't know how much longer we're going to see Jared Walsh, but Jared Walsh is is performing exceptionally. And in you plug Justin Foscue, who is a fantastic hitter. He really is a fantastic hitter. There's just not a whole lot of room on this roster for a fantastic hitter who doesn't also provide value at a premium defensive position. I mean, Josh Smith is that dude, but he plays shortstop and third base. That's why he is still on this roster. And even though Justin Foskey might be a little bit better of a hitter than him, we'll see over the course of the season if Josh Smith can maintain this insane rate. He can't. Nobody can. Expand, swing and missing at just 3.6% of pitches is nutso and fantastic from Josh Smith. He's made a few changes to his stance from what he was doing last year, and he had a really funny answer when when the Rangers beats asked him, Why, why'd you make this change? He was like, well, I was hitting a buck 50-something last year, so I, I figured it might be time for a change. And so far this year, he's hitting over 300, and on base of 450, slugging at 438, just one extra base hit so far. But 
I got to feel like more extra base hits are coming for Josh Smith. And if he can continue putting together these kind of plate appearances and this kind of defense, and even if it's not, it's not going to be over a full season where he just goes nuclear like this. If he does, then maybe the Rangers have a conversation about who's playing where and what and when, and it changes a lot of different things. But for right now, to be a championship team, to be a team that goes back to back, you need to have this level of depth, this insane level of depth that the Rangers have right now. They've got it. Justin Foscue is would be one of the top hitting pro, is one of the better hitters in minor league baseball. I'm convinced. Puts together fantastic at bats. It's got the power. It's got the batting eye. Doesn't swing and miss a whole lot. And on many many teams, he could be a starting second baseman or first baseman or DH or left fielder. They would find somewhere for Justin Foscue's bat on some other team. But this isn't just some other team. This is the best team in the American League West right now, maybe the best team in the American League, and they are clicking on all cylinders. Outside of a certain rookie who is getting the least generous strike zone I think I might have ever seen. Coming from talk about Wyatt Langford's slow start to the season, why I'm not concerned. Why not only am I not concerned, I'm just a little bit angry and not at Wyatt Langford. Right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch, with la- with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game Time takes all the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. It is the best way I have ever found to buy tickets. It is so fast. It is so convenient. It is so easy. And having those all up all in prices to let you see exactly how much your tickets are going to cost right from the start. No surprise fees at the end. It lets you know it's the honest ticketing site and it is so simple and easy to use. Download the Game Time app today. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. For a limited time, all users can get $20 off any MLB purchase of $150 or more in the Game Time app with code First Pitch. Terms apply. That's code First Pitch for $20 off from March 25th to April 14th only. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Now, with Evan Carter pulling out of his mini slump, it seems like the, well, outside of Jonah Heim, which he's a catcher, and I'm, I'm giving him a break for all time for his offense, the offense from Jonah Heim will always be ancillary, a, a sprinkle of extra on top of the insane value that he brings defensively to the pitching staff um, and just everything that he does behind the plate. But the one guy who's in this everyday starting lineup outside of Heim, who has an OPS plus below league average, is questionably Wyatt Langford. It's not questionable that it is below 100. It's it's obviously below 100. It's at 73 at this point. A 602 OPS for the rookie nine games into his big league career. And... I'd say at least a decent part of it, maybe not all of it, but a decent part of it is this guy who has been in the big leagues for about five seconds, having one of the least generous strike zones that I have seen in some time. And the most egregious version of it was Sunday night's game with Ronel Blanco, with a couple of sliders that were, I'd say at least five, six, seven, eight, thirty 30 inches outside the zone, both being called strikes and getting him called out on strikes, on pitches that were eight miles outside the zone. And this is not the first time that Wyatt Langford has been the, what's the opposite of a beneficiary? The anti-beneficiary of a ungenerous and ungenerous strike zone. And it feels like the same thing that happened to Josh Young last year. Young's strikeout rate and his walk rate were both terrible last year, in, in large part due to the fact that he was not getting called a fair strike zone last year. Especially, I feel like it was especially egregious in a couple of games in the ALCS against Justin Verlander, some calls that were just, they're impossible pitches to hit. And if you're giving Justin Verlander those calls, then what the heck is Josh Young supposed to do but expand the strike zone? And so far, that's been a similar case for White Langford. Now, his, his chase rate and his swing and miss rate are, are both pretty darn good. Chase rate... It, 76 percentile in baseball just over 21 percent of the time he is swinging or he's expanding the zone and his whiff rate is in the top 20 percent of baseball just 18 and a half percent 
but his strikeout rate is right around middle of the pack. His walk rate is in the 36th percentile because he is not getting the fairest strike zone. He is still hitting balls very hard. He is a little bit more selective of a hitter than I thought he would be. Not that I thought he would be expanding his own, but I thought he'd be more of the Seager version of aggressive. But he definitely leans more towards the Evan Carter spectrum of he know, he knows exactly what he can hit, and he knows that he can do damage on it, and he is not going to expand the zone or try and do more than he can. He knows himself, and he knows his best qualities, and I think eventually over the course of the season, the the zone will iron out more for him a little bit. But for right now, I think that's at least part of the reason why he is having such struggles. He's still, you know, having good quality at bats, good length at bats. He's not just, you know, popping out on the first pitch that's, you know, eight miles out of the strike zone. He is still putting together quality at bats in the three hole for these Rangers. I think he will continue to hit in the three hole for a while, even despite these not great results so far, because the Rangers trust him. And I don't think that the slump will last much longer. I'm surprised that it's taken this long for White Langford to get his first MLB home run. But, you know, sometimes these things take time. Even the best rookies struggle at times. And the thing that separates White Langford, why I'm confident that this slump won't last much longer, is that he makes adjustments really quickly. We see it from game to game, from a bat to bat, even sometimes from pitch to pitch. This guy learns from his mistakes, learns from how hitters are, or how pitchers are attacking him, and adjusts accordingly and proceeds to have success. One of the things that is still surprising to me is Wyatt Langford's speed. I mean, we've seen this guy put on base running displays so far, and at first I didn't think that he was faster than Evan Carter. It might still not be over the course of the season, but you look at the StatCast leaderboard for sprint speed in all of Major League Baseball right now, Wyatt Langford is the fifth fastest player in Major League Baseball at this moment. Number one, Victor Scott the second from the Cardinals. Okay. His, his whole deal is speed. And so that makes sense. Bobby Witt Jr. Number two. Okay. Also makes sense. Also elite burner. Jo- Johan Rojas of the Phillies. Number three, Trey Turner. Number four, Wyatt Langford. Number five. Oh, and El- Evan Carter, by the way, is number seven. So this guy who not only hits the absolute crap out of the baseball is an absolute physical specimen and an, an elite hitter. We haven't seen it show Full evidence right now. He hasn't gone on a crazy hot streak, but we will see it from White Langford. But pairing all of that with literally top end of the scale speed is what makes this kid so darn special and why I am so incredibly excited for his future because we knew he was fast. We knew he was pretty fast, but we didn't know that he was top five sprint speed in baseball fast. Maybe that's just me. But anyway, this Rangers team taking advantage of the first two out of three against the Astros, taking advantage of their early season strong start. This is a great sign for your Rangers team. Because again, the name of the game for this entire season is just hold out till reinforcements are coming. Reinforcements are on the way. The Joshes will return at some point. Max Scherzer will return at some point. Hopefully Jacob DeGrom will be back this season. And also Michael Lorenzen and Tyler Malley will be back at some point this season. Which, as for what happens with Tyler Malley, he's going to make one more rehab start. And then I think after that, he will be ready to rejoin the Rangers rotation. Will be built up to about 90 pitches. I think the Rangers will probably go with a six-man rotation at that point. Rather than demote somebody out of the starting unit. It would have been pretty easily Cody Bradford, but his first two starts have been phenomenal. You can't bump this guy out of the rotation after seven and two-thirds innings of mostly shutout baseball outside of one inherited runner scored against the freaking Houston Astros. You just can't do that to the kid. And as for the guy who struggled the most this season, John Gray, it's been two starts. He's been a reliable middle of the rotation starter for two seasons in Texas. And he's not going to the bullpen for for Michael Lorenzen at this point. As for Dane Dunning, even he's had some struggles, but he's not going to the pen either. I think they're going to ride with this five, this six-man rotation through this 17-game and 17-day stretch. As for who goes to the pen after this, maybe it does still end up being Cody Bradford. Maybe it's Andrew Heaney. Maybe it is John Gray. But at this point, the Rangers have depth coming and, and getting out to this hot start. Taking advantage of these early games against the Astros, they matter. They matter big time. 
and the Rangers losing that game on Sunday, it might end up stinging a little bit looking back later on in the season of just, okay, well, that was kind of dumb getting just mollywop by Ronel Blanco, just getting no hit for five and a third innings or however long it was. But again, that's kind of what I love about baseball is, is sometimes these guys who come out of nowhere and can be stars for a week. Uh, granted, I'd rather them be on the Rangers and the Astros, but still, it's one of the fun things about baseball. But still, these early games matter, and if the Rangers can do more than just hold on for the first half of the season while they're waiting for the reinforcements of the Joshes, of the Scherzers, DeGroms, Mallies, and Michael Lorenzens, then things start to get a lot more interesting and a lot better looking for this Rangers squad and their projection to hopefully take that AL West title back from those stinking Houston Astros. Raiders have an important game on Monday. Hopefully can take three out of four this series, and then we'll see what this team looks like going into Houston, a place where the Rangers have a five-game active winning streak. Who knows? Maybe they can make it eight by the end of next weekend, but taking advantage early on with an offense that is clicking, with a starting staff that is clicking, and a bullpen that is loaded with options, things are looking pretty darn nice for your Texas Rangers to start the season. That's going to do it for today's show. Thank you all so much for listening and subscribing. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy World Series champion Texas Rangers baseball.